by the fact that China has turned to them in the first place and have not been able to develop these things domestically, it would just be foolish to waste the most critical form of leverage that we have over regulating China's behavior. I'm going to do a few things in this speech. Firstly, start out with a model and then chat about three things. Number one, a characterization as to why China is uniquely reliant on US parts. Secondly, and given that, what is likely to change about the world and why will better China's behavior? And then thirdly, just some pre-battle by retaliation from China will not be significant into our model. So firstly, we would make like banning the selling of parts conditional on a couple of things. Firstly, full transparency from Chinese markets when it comes to things like what tech companies are actually doing and more demanding more specific reforms when it comes to things like data collection from the firms, but secondly, more international security forms, i.e. more specific disclosure and allowing monitoring of what they are doing when firms um, like Huawei get data, stuff like that. The second thing to say under this model is that we would also impose secondary sanctions on other countries who continue to sell these particular parts to China. Note, we uniquely have the fiat to do this because Jason told me that in the WUDC manual, it says that in a motion where X actor should do Y, under rule 2.3, you have fiat to like specify how the actor would do that thing, but also just based on precedent, like when the US makes a policy, they often impose secondary sanctions as well. So first claim, as a characterization, why is China uniquely reliant on these kinds of US parts? A couple things to say here. Firstly, like historically speaking, a lot of these parts were just initially created in the United States because they have an extremely developed tech sector in the form of Silicon Valley. Crucially, given that the US developed this first, other countries just didn't go in and specialize in the exact same sectors when it came to like semiconductor production, because that would have been like economically foolish when the US would have always had a comparative advantage in that sector, allowing them to do things like be more competitive in the kind of prices that, that, that they sell. So you just do not get the development of tech sectors as robust as the United States and other countries that exist. Secondly, though, US parts, even if they might like vaguely exist in other countries, are substantially more affordable. This is because just due to the size and scale of the US economy, their manufacturing is just incredibly, incredibly efficient. They have a lot of factories. They meet very high demand, allowing them to sell these parts to China at incredibly affordable prices. Finally, the US would just be effective in implementing secondary sanctions and banning other countries. The reason that secondary sanctions work, so i.e. if other countries sell this to China, the US imposing sanctions on them is effective, is because of the massive kinds of dollarization of the global economy, where if the US banking system freezes out assets, so you have systems like SWIFT that exist, other countries will have economic repercussions and therefore have an incentive to comply to the United States. So there is a high extent of reliance on the US that exists. Given that, why are we going to benefit China's behavior? What I want to do here is outline like all the different scenarios about what China might do and explain why these are beneficial for our side of the house. Firstly, I think the most likely scenario is that China is actually likely to come to the negotiating table and make the reforms that we have laid out in our model. The reason that this characterization is, is true is for a few particular kinds of reasons in terms of like why China will actually care about this. The first thing to say is that the economy is really important to China because it relies on it for its own domestic legitimacy as the CPC. Unlike democratic systems, they get their legitimacy from the vote. China has an artificial social construct where to prevent things like protests, they literally have to deliver on like relatively high levels of economics and therefore going to care about having their businesses become substantially less competitive. Secondly, though, as a piece of framing in 2018, China's GDP was like the lowest that it has been in 28 years, which is compounded by COVID in a recent banking crisis where there's massive amounts of debt, meaning that they are very economically sensitive. So we now have the stick to threaten them economically. They are likely to come to the negotiating table. This is really beneficial because we are just able to get reforms that are beneficial for like international security. We can stop things like the massive abuse of data that harm like a lot of citizens that China often uses to engage in blackmail. And we just like help a lot of civilians through better security legislation. Second potential alternative, China tries to develop these parts domestically to better their own companies. Why is this either like unlikely to happen or okay? Firstly, we question whether China has the economic capacity to do this, given the framing that I used in the previous sub point. Secondly, even if China tries to do this, there's going to be a critical time lag. And this is really crucial panel. If China could have just developed their own semiconductors and tech parts in like five or 10 years, they would have done so status quo because they don't like any kind of reliance on another country like the United States. The reason they have not turned to this in the first place is due to the massive cost of developing these sectors, but also like the decades it takes to develop the industrial capacity to have such um, advanced manufacturing capacity that ultimately exists. So they might be able to do this domestically in like 20 years. However, in the interim, US companies are now going to become substantially less competitive relative to Chinese companies because they do not have the parts that they ultimately need. The final thing to say here is that it is bad for like tech sectors in the West to have Develop a relationship with China where large US manufacturing companies are selling these parts to China. The reason this is ultimately harmful is that powerful lobbyists in the United States now become 
economically interconnected to Chinese companies because you're getting money from selling goods to a large market base. Therefore, lobbyists in the United States are going to demand fewer regulations over when it comes to things like the trade relationship with China and data requirements because they fear alienating that economic relationship. So the impact of this argument is that U.S. companies are going to be advantaged and also other Western companies outside of the U.S. asymmetrically relative to the Chinese tech sector. This is important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we prefer Western companies doing better because there are democratic accountability mechanisms when it comes to data, i.e. like the GDPR regulation things in Europe that China does not possess. But secondly, it's just bad for like national security interests. We have massive companies like Alibaba who have a massive amount of data. I'll take the O clarification or the CO clarification. Yeah, so I, I don't want to be nitpicky, but the motion says you should ban. You say you'd just like to make it conditional on some very vague things such as inspectors and transparency. Okay. I mean, gotcha. So I think we can ban in the short term and just like say we would attach things to banning, given that we have fiat power to illustrate how the US would act, but also not all of our case is contingent on, on reforms. Final sub point, even if China would try and turn to like other partners, this is fine. Number one, because of secondary sanctions, we can stop a lot of that from happening. But if they do, other partners are A, less te technologically developed, B, it still gives a comparative advantage to US firms because they can develop tech faster when they're selling it to US companies rather than to Chinese companies. But thirdly, the lobbying process that I described in the United States would be particularly pernicious given that the US has a lot of like precedential setting when it comes to how we approach um, China in general with, with these kinds of regulations. So it's bad for the US to have like a political approach that would be scared of alienating Chinese collaborative partners. Final claim is pre -buttle. Why will retaliation from China not be bad or not really matter? Firstly, we have like kicked out Huawei on, like under the status quo and they haven't really done anything that major. Secondly, China's desperate economically, so they're, so, so they're scared. But crucially, they also know that if they try to retaliate against the United States in the form of reigniting the trade war, the US is just going to meet them with more tit for tat sanctions. And therefore, that will continually harm them economically. So it'd be an irrational choice to engage in the first kind of retaliation. But thirdly, this would not be a tipping point in worsening the relationship, given a bajillion other things that China is pissed about, like the like detaining men, stuff like that. So it's not really going to matter that, that much. Look, we have this piece of leverage. It would be foolish not to use it. Very proud to stand in opening government. All right, thank you very much, Prime Minister. I'd like to invite the leader of our opposition. Here, here. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. This is going to be fun. Three, two, one, go. First of all, a few points of clarification about what China creates and not creates today, who are the biggest companies today in the manufacturing world, and what is going to happen with the very weird OG model. Like, first of all, we don't think OG's model is in any way logical because you don't have those sort of sanctions even on Iran. You need like a UN pass to like do all of those stuff like the US have tried to do with Iran. When the US has done like the, the trade war with China last year, it was considered unconstitutional that Trump has used his power to do those things. And we think that doing secondary sanctions is very weird, but we are going to completely accept this because it goes to our side as well. Who are the biggest actors in the market? So first of all, just to clarify, China today already manufactures all of the parts for the new Huawei phones. This is true from the model of last year. This wasn't true five years ago, but it is true since of last year. This goes even to the semiconductors. But even if you don't buy those things, and if you think that China is like relying on those semiconductor stuff, even if you have secondary sanctions, you don't have third part sanctions because you can't like do, if someone sells to someone, who then sells to China, you do those things, because then literally it goes to all of the global economy. Why does this make a lot of like relevance in this motion? Because the other big phone companies are not US phone companies. Those companies are companies like Samsung, a South Korean one, and the many of the semiconductors companies are mostly in South Korea or Taiwan. So even if you completely ban Qualcomm, which is a Taiwanese company, to sell those stuff to the US, it doesn't make any difference because they can still sell it to Samsung, which means that they are probably going to continue to sell to China and not sell to the US because the only thing Qualcomm do in this regard is selling to China much more than it sell to Apple who does create its own semiconductors. So we think that semiconductors are really out of this motion. What is changing other than the fact that now Qualcomm is banned in the US? The most important thing that is changing is specifically software because as I've said, 
like the, the hardware is already Chinese manufactured, but what software is not, specifically Android and specifically Microsoft Windows. Those are the two key components that are still manufactured within the US and will be banned after this specific motion as they are mostly US companies software. What are the impacts of that? Before that, another uh, slightly few other points of rebuttal. I, okay, I, I was a little messed up. So I talk about three things. First of all, the impact on the US economy. Second of all, the impact on the, on like the US versus Chinese impact on the world. And third of all, what is the Chinese response is going to be? Let's begin before that one more point on free battle. We don't think that China is going to get all of those like big leverages that governments wanted them to do because China has, like I've said, they've already got the ability to manufacture most of the hardware. And regarding to software, it is going to make some problems today, but probably in like a six months or one year delay, they're going to be good enough. Most of the people who buy them will still buy them because there will be cheaper phones than other phones. Maybe it will be slightly worse than Android, but we think that they could do that. And we don't think that being in Corona is something that prevents specifically the high-tech sector, as we see in the US, the high-tech sector is quite thriving. Let's move on. So how it's going to affect specifically the American economy? Because as I've said, the two main companies that are being affected by this motion is specifically Google and Microsoft. Google and Microsoft today, let, like, let's frame it very good. Google and Microsoft today take a huge share out, out of the S&P 500. As we've seen, the S&P goes up in the last three months, although other than the big five companies, everyone went down, which means that a lot of the American economy is actually predicated on the fact that Google and Microsoft are going to succeed. Why is it going to create a lot of harm to specifically Google and Microsoft? Because Huawei today is the most sold um, uh, cell phone. It is more, uh, there are more Huawei phones than Samsung phones. There are more Huawei phones than any other other phones in the planet. And that's without talking about Xiaomi, without talking about ZTE or all of the other Chinese companies, which means that a lot of the money that Google profits specifically is from doing that in a lot of phones around the world. Second to why they're going to lose a lot of money, because specifically when companies are evaluating their shares for the future, they think about where they can grow. And the specific places Google and Microsoft wants to go is in third world countries that specifically buys more of the Chinese phone. When Google are cut out of those specific countries, their ability to grow in the places they want to grow as much is very, being reducted by a lot. Why is this very impactful? Because even if they don't start losing money tomorrow, it means the projection of the growth is being much, much lower, which means that their share is going to get much, much lower. What are the impacts of that? First of all, it's probably going to cause a lot of people to lose their jobs and just big harms to the economy. But more importantly, we think that specifically it's going to create a crash within the American S&P 500 or any other like uh, stocks. Why is that so important? Because we think that today Trump is wanting all the Americans to just believe that the economy is just fine. And if the S&P is going to crash, it's going to lose a lot of the trust of the people who actually put their money investing in the stocks in the US, which means it's probably going to cause people believe that there is an economic crisis starting to happen with all of the other stuff that's related to Corona. Think that the chance that, that the entire stock market will crash because of it, or that people will just lose a lot of the money that they've invested in companies like Google or like Microsoft, specifically on their pension, specifically on their saving accounts, is immense. And this is a huge, huge impact that doesn't, like, when we don't get like any po very good positive things within uh, the government that do that. Before I move on, I will take second if they have any. If not first, OG? The problem OG. with this argument is that the vast majority of these tech companies are some of the most diversified in the world, including Google having things like search engines, moonshots, and multiple departments. Why do you think this is the tipping point for the harms you describe? We think that most searches happens on mobile phones today. The fact that Google gets searched in the third world countries, it's only because they use Android phones where Google is the default. When this is going to be changed because it's going to be Chinese Android, which doesn't have Google but has Baidu, Google is not going to get search results, which means that it doesn't have any power on the people within those developing countries specifically, which is the market Google wants to grow in. Now let's talk about what how it is going to ghost interactions on affiliating like other 
countries. Because we think that today, because Chinese already sell their phones and they will continue to do this after each motion, they already had enough of an ability to go after this country, get the information about them, push them or all of those things. But today, also the American companies have a lot of power within those countries. The fact that Google have a lot of information about the people there, the fact that a lot of companies will use Microsoft in those places when the Chinese companies come there, people will get used to Microsoft in those places, means that Google and Microsoft has an ability to compete against these Chinese companies and sway those countries from using Chinese companies to using other companies. This ability is being diminished significantly when you don't have those products specifically, which means that the ability to actually affect the politics, the economist, or whatever of those countries specifically is being diminished significantly. The harms of the Chinese people are going to be happening on both sides of the house. But on our side, we tend to, for, to uh, take the other ways of mitigating those harms. Please oppose the motion. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to invite the DPF. Yeah, yeah. I prefer verbal POIs, by the way. So just like ask me a POI. Okay, great. Before I move into the meat of this speech, I just want to clarify where opening opposition is clearly lying in this debate. First of all, in case CEO tries to contest this, secondary sanctions are applied against Iran. That is why the Iranian economy is suffering and it isn't actually trading with China. So CEO, you can't contest that. The second important lie that comes out from the opening opposition is this assertion that most of this tech comes out from China itself. This is blatantly false. Consider this, if China could efficiently produce all these products themselves, why isn't all the industry already domestic given that it creates Chinese jobs? Given the fact that they currently trade with the US, clearly that indicates that there's some degree of a relationship of reliance and I'm going to explain why that is the case. I'm going to chat about two different things. First of all, I want to chat about the change in China's policies and why this is going to be a massive win for national security. Second of all, I want to talk about economic effects. And lastly, I'm going to provide a new constructive argument about principle of obligations. So to begin with, let's chat about why China will change and why there are significant national security benefits that end up accruing as a consequence of our policy. I don't think the open opposition does a particularly good job of engaging with all of the structural arguments that we provided as to why there's a harm. The only piece of mitigation that comes out from their side of the house is a response to secondary sanctions. They say that private companies can just get these parts and then sell to China indirectly. Untrue. If Samsung engages in this sort of commerce, you're going to be able to sanction South Korea as a whole and there are actually incentives to do so, or at the very least, limit Samsung's access to the American financial system. So you can localize that harm and we posit that incentives are large enough that you would punish South Korea writ large. But also note they don't respond to any of our other mechanisms. They don't respond to the fact that you'd have to increase the amount of factories that you have, the human capital, and the training that you have for that human capital, which takes a long portion of time. Let me add an extra mechanism here as to why it is the case we have an exclusive benefit on our side of the house. You also need to consider things like intellectual property laws. So intellectual property laws will prohibit other companies from being able to develop these goods. Perhaps China won't listen to IP laws, but this means that the vast majority of other partners that they would engage with aren't able to create these conductors. Why is that important? Because we think the quality of conductors is better within the US, but more importantly, China needs a massive amount of these conductors and semiconductors and other products. The reason why comes from the opening opposition themselves when they say that there's a massive number of Chinese phones sold around the world, five to eight million. You need to make sure in the US alone, you need to have enough goods to be able to do that. So China will never be able to upscale to the extent in which they can actually provide for those numbers. What is the implication on our side of the house? They never respond to our mechanism about why this brings China to the negotiating table because they're economically reliant on this policy. Given the fact that such a large number of Chinese phones are sold, you have to buy that this is impactful for the Chinese economy as well. This also personally implicates Xi Jinping too in a time where yeah, he's right? already being contested locally and domestically, no thank you, by opponents of the CCP who believe that he has taken too much power, CF Chinese academics who have publicly spoken out against him. Given this fact, and the fact that Chinese economic growth is at 6.6%, the lowest in 28 years, there are massive incentives to care about your economy and capitulate and engage with negotiation. So you get none of the harms of opening opposition in the long run because you still engage yeah, in trade right. and you still have that kind of reform and change them. No thanks. I want to point out this is within our fiat given that in the 2011 World Finals, Victor Finkel has a conditional military intervention. So I think this is completely reasonable on our side of the house. But even if you don't think China is going to change, we told you that there are additional impacts. First of all, that this gives Western companies comparative win in developing infrastructure like 5G to develop in other states because they have access to prime real estate and prime technology. So that means that they're able to introduce 5G networks instead of Huawei, circumventing the security harm of taking all that data information. 
We also told you about the lobbying power that China has when U.S. companies are trading with them. Why is this national security the most important thing in the round? It is because it is such a violation of individual privacy and autonomy when you're being watched. But moreover, past just the fact that everyone's privacy is potentially hurt, meaning that there's a chilling effect where they won't engage in certain activities online. This also means that there are concrete security harms that might end up accruing as a consequence because of the fact that you have access to sensitive information from Western telecommunications networks. So that is why we have a massive win on this question about why China will change and why even if they don't change, we have a comparative win as a whole, given the time lap leg that happens. Second, on the economy. So I think we've done a lot of work as to explaining why there is an economic retaliation. Note that my framing about why it is that China's weak economically and Xi Jinping has actual threats domestically means that it's very difficult for you to actually engage in economic sanctions because China will be hurt disproportionately given that they rely on economic legitimacy and given their slow economic growth. The biggest argument that comes out from the opposition is that Google and Microsoft are going to have substantial harms. So a few different things I want to point out here. First of all, their businesses are very diversified. They have assets all over the place. Google has a separate part of their division called Moonshots, which is literally for speculative ventures like self-driving cars. They have tons of stuff. The only response that they have is that you need to have phones to be able to Google. First of all, you can clearly Google on laptops and other devices. Second of all, their unique mechanism is that you have Google built into these devices. Sorry, but on devices, what is built in is the browser. People individually choose to go on Google as a site, so that is untrue. People actually go on Google on the other side of the house. What a ludicrous mechanism from them. Uh, I'll take closing or opening if only opening has a POI. Let's do opening then. Yeah, we think that generally China does, is not dependent on the stuff that you've said as much as it is, and therefore it's not going to break up, and none of your positivity is going to happen in this debate. Uh, I mean, so for you to say that they are a massive part of global telecommunications and that this would literally sink Google seems to imply to me that this would be a large part of the a Chinese market as well, given how overstated your impacts are in terms of how much this is a proportion of trade. So. The second thing I want to point out is that if the stock market crashes, it's likely going to crash for other reasons that we've identified, so like coronavirus. Finally, in the long run, we give Western companies a huge comparative advantage, given the fact that they no longer have lobbying from foreign companies, which would advance Chinese economic interests, as well as allowing Western companies to develop economically to provide 5G infrastructure, et cetera, meaning that in the long run, this is a form of protectionism, which boosts domestic jobs and hurt, uh, helps the economy writ large. But even if you think the US economy is hurt, we just frankly think that the national security of everyone in the world, not just US citizens, matters more on principled obligations in this debate. I, this is going to be brief, but I think irrespective of consequences, you should not be facilitating the harm that occurs because the surveillance that is used through this technology is used to crack down upon dissidents, both domestically with their Chinese products, but also in terms of the global world, in terms of the world itself. Even if a different party steps in, and I don't think they will, but even if a different party steps in, we think it is morally wrong to be complicit. It's the same reason why even if it is the case, someone else will give a criminal a gun, you should not be the one who gives them that gun because it personally implicates you in the moral wrongs that occur. We think that this is a principled obligation for states to engage in, and therefore we think that this is just independently of anything else. We weigh as the most important, and the opening opposition arguments are absurd. Opening government win. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. To close the opening half, I'd like to invite the deputy leader of opposition. Here, here. Just set the timer. Can you hear me? I'd like to start with two important things. Firstly, notice that even if we accept that China is not a good actor in the world, notice that we don't get a real analysis of why we need to have this extreme measure of banning US companies in the US in order to virtue signal that we are this good nation and at the same time harming our own economy. It doesn't make any sense. It seems to me like if you have a problem with China, there are various ways of dealing with it, especially if they believe that the US has so much leverage over the West. We can inform people. We can have different, uh, uh, different. Uh, how do you call it? The uh, tariffs and so and so on. You don't need to shoot your own leg in order to do that. So we never get an explanation of why this specific mechanism. But then we get this. Uh, we get this statement saying, "Well, look. Obviously, we are right, and China is so dependent on us because if it weren't, why doesn't it?" manufacturer today. 
So look, this is a gradual process. The fact that it doesn't do everything today doesn't mean that A, it's not doing so gradually. Already Edo tells you that in their latest models, they do manufacture their own hardware. So yes, they may not be able to support all their models. And we think that if you have the ability to continue on doing both, why not do it gradually? But it doesn't mean that they don't have the ability if they have to do that. Then we say that in terms of software, it's not the most convenient thing, once again, to shift immediately. But would they prefer Baidu? Of course they would. They just think that other consumers are used to Google, are used to Windows. However, we do think that eventually, if a consumer has to choose between a very, very cheap phone to buy in Africa or in South America that doesn't have Google but has a very good system nevertheless, and an other uh, phone, they would still choose the Chinese one. So what you are doing is you are simply saying to China, you have to shift more quickly into the change that you want. And Ido already explains to you why we think that this is a matter of months. So yes, it's not pleasant, but it doesn't mean that eventually you get the type of success that you want on your side. But then they tell us, look, our main issue is China is spying on people and they're stealing people's IPs. But then their entire case relies on being successful in their mechanism. But we say that here China doesn't want to change and it has very strong incentives against and China doesn't need it to change. Now, why doesn't it not want? So here we say that it's a matter of cost and benefit analysis. So we say that national security for China and the ability to do things like espionage is always more important than a bit more economy. Now here they say, ah, oh, but China is suffer economically. Notice that this is another matter of comparative because the US is suffering more economically. So while China has uh, stocks in, every, in various countries all over the world, they continue on manufacturing. Now they don't have Corona miraculously while the US is like a third world state in that matter. So we don't think that this is the thing that is going to cause China to break down, especially since they didn't break down in the trade war that, uh, that happened before. Secondly, we say that also in the economy, stealing IP is a main source of revenue generally for China and for other companies. They cannot simply back down because of one sector that, uh, the, uh, that America is trying to take from them. Thirdly, especially according to the analysis that we get from opening government, it seems like if she is dependent on uh, being powerful, giving up to the U.S. shows that he's way less powerful than they think, meaning that he personally doesn't want to do it and doesn't want to back down. But then we also say that the Chinese don't have to. And here they are missing Ido's case once again, because they are missing the point that Quecom, that is Taiwanese, meaning that China has much more influence over them than the United States has because they can bring in even the troops and the Taiwanese know that that's why they are careful are selling to Samsung. Now here, the fact that they're saying, oh, we'll boycott Samsung too is ridiculous because then this means that you have to boycott every telephone company that there is. Seriously, do you want to harm the American and all the Western uh, public that much as to deny them every type of cell phone, refrigerator, micro microwave and TV? That's ludicrous. Also, you alienate so many of your allies that this makes no sense. And in other conflicts in the world, you don't do it. Conflicts that can annihilate other uh, allies that you have. So why the IP is that important in order to do that? God knows, I have no idea. So this means that China would have the ability to overcome this barrier to still get their phones out in the market. And then what we are left with is all of the harms that are going to happen to the US uh, economy. Now here they try to tell us, ah, but those harms are not that great. But notice that they don't already analyze to you that they don't need to be that grave in order to signal to the market that there is an imbalance of powers here. And in order to make tough decisions for many countries and many consumers in a way that harms the trajectory of those huge companies like Google or Microsoft. Moreover, we say that specifically when it comes to telecommunications, the mere fact that you are now going to have less phones that use American software is horrible for uh, those companies and for the freedom of information generally. Before I continue, POI from Connor. 
Um, so my POI is that the info slide has an asterisk saying that the vast majority of these products are uh, produced by uh, US companies. So isn't that a real problem for the framing and opening opposition? So A, facts. B, we say that the majority includes software. We agree on that and we explain why this is not a major problem. So that's on that. So then once you have more and more phones that don't have people using Google and Facebook, you're actually incentivizing more of the creation of the second internet. You're creating a situation where the West has less control and ability to influence what is censored and what is not. Because while currently it can pressure Google and Facebook not to cooperate with every type of censorship, in the day that they are not used so much in phones everywhere, you get more and more people that get censored content in them. And we think that this is harmful, A, to the ability to have leverage in that sense, which is also important to the US, but also in order to promote general freedom worldwide and the ability of people to get more access to more information, not only to what the Chinese want them to. So for all of those reasons, I'm very proud to oppose. All right. Can everyone hear me well? Yep. Panel, four points of extension from uh, closing composition today. Um, but but, uh, but close, yeah, so four points of extension from CO today. I also want to point out that we think beforehand that, you know, maybe what OO says will happen might happen in some world that the stock market crashes, Google dies, all of the world economies go to shit because of this sort of semiconductor thing. We think on closing opposition will be far more reasonable and far more realistic, I think, than, than this extreme portrayal, um, or at least you know, quite, quite ambitious, let's call it, portrayal from opening opposition. But jumping into our um, uh, extension points, and rebuttal will be intertwined. So first of all, I want to point out that, and, and I'm surprised this hasn't been brought up till closing government. I want to point out, first of all, that um, the context in which you're applying this motion is one of an already existing um, trade war between the US and China. There's a massive trade war already ongoing for political reasons as well. There is already massive antagonism uh, uh, between the two, these two countries. That means that any substantial ban like this one will already escalate, will even further escalate that uh, trade war which is already existing. We think that it's extraordinarily likely that China will slap tariffs on American goods, not just tech products, but American goods from grains, barley, you know, cars, but also other technology products which don't need semiconductors, right? Importantly, this will apply across the board because they're already in the context of a trade war where they're already applying uh, uh, trade sanctions tit for tat one upon each other. Now, I also want to point out that it's unlikely that China will, will sort of bow down from that trade war because they're very antagonized. They would be losing face and also letting the U.S. win if they would be backing down. They will respond to this ban with a lot more bans and tariffs on other American goods. I'll get into why that's well, well, okay, so why is that horrible for everyone? First of all, obviously that means prices go up both in the US but across the world and accessibility of products goes down. This is obvious why it happens in the US given you can't access these products and you have to pay extra for tariffs that harms all consumers but also harms other places in the world because many countries in the world are caught in the supply chains between the US and China and will suffer from the decrease uh, in, in possibility of paying and purchasing power of consumers within America and respectively China. That includes Europe, that includes third world countries where prices will increase for consumers and accessibility goes down. Now, that's horrible, obviously, for consumers. What CG says is they admit all of this because they literally said it and then said, we want, or CG says, they want to harm the economy so Biden will win because harming the economy now under Trump will mean Biden will win the election. Look, we pause it and we're going to prove that Biden will win anyway. So it's symmetrical that Biden will win uh, irrespective of this policy. So what you're just doing is harming the US and the global economy for no reason. Why will Biden win for sure? A, because the already, first of all, we'll put one, because the economy is already in the dumpster because of Corona and Biden has, has uh, increased by more than, it has a gap of more than 10% in, uh, in favorability and in polls ahead of the election. Second of all, because Trump massively mishandled the pandemic and caused, you know, the massive, the uh, 
largest outbreak in the world, and 85% of Americans already blame him massively um, for that mishandling. First of all, because in key swing states such as Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida, Biden has a massive up, specifically because of his you know, traditional white uh, uh, rural approach, right, which maybe we dislike in debating, but is highly effective in these swing states, right? And he's already up in some of these swing states by more than 15%. Now, obviously, that means that the Biden will win anyway. So this motion, you don't need this motion for him to win. And what you're just doing is harming the US and global economy for no reason whatsoever. Now, I also want to point out that OG says, no, no, China won't retaliate and won't respond to this trade war because China is weak economically. That's absurd, right? They have obviously massive resources and state control industries and do currency manipulation, which keeps their exports far more attractive, even if they have some economic trouble. But also regarding Corona, there's a uh, state that which has bounced back the fastest, more the faster than everyone else. So they're ahead of everyone else at the moment. And also Jason says, oh, Xi is weak because of academics in China. Like you're joking. He has a massive control over academia, over university, over the political sphere. Now, second extension we bring to you after we've proven that. I want to point out that OO keeps saying that China will produce its own, um, uh, OO keeps saying that China will produce its own semiconductors very quickly, but they just counter, they just assert that, right? Here's, here's uh, six uh, structural reasons why China will actually be able to replace the US in terms of uh, producing its own semiconductors and why OG is wrong by saying they can't do it quickly. First of all, obviously they have massive amount of money and massive amount of tech capability, which is state sponsor, which is endless because they're very willing to do money printing, right? Second of all, they have human capital and can force workers to work in their uh, factories as they have been doing. Third of all, they're buying out US scientists from US institutions and taking them out both either by money or by espionage, right? And taking out all the know-how from the US. Fourth of all, the top Chinese universities such as Beijing University have been massively putting out patents already, right? Last year, they put out double the amount Stanford University put out, right? Fifth of all, they have massive access to rare earth minerals, which are critical in semiconductor building. The reason they have access to rare earth minerals is because they have massive control over the One Belt, One Road project, which contains countries such as Kenya, such as um, Mozambique, where these rare earth minerals are being mined and China has prime access for them. And sixth of all, they have no respect for IP laws, meaning they can steal any information and put it within their technology and thus produce very quickly. That means they'll produce very quickly and become a, and substitute the US absence very quickly. That means government's impacts don't materialize whatsoever. But also I want to point out, and now I, I'm entering, well, first of all, we provide these sorts of reasons. So OO's credit for any of these arguments goes to us as regards to why they can replace them. But also I also want to point out, first of all, that this has other impacts as well. If you implement this ban, you as the US are relinquishing your prime position as a world leader in this industry, right? As a, and as a world supplier, not only to China, but also to all other countries around the world, which you're the prime, uh, in the prime position to supply. You're hastening your descent in terms of the world's semiconductor supplier, because China has massively accelerated uh, their ability to supply because of your ban. That means a lot of third party countries, right? So developing countries, but also Europe, right? Will likely fall out of the US's technology sphere of influence and reorient to China, because China is cheaper when they produce semiconductors, right? They're far cheaper within this instance because of all the reasons I've given you. The impacts of that are, first of all, China has massive ability to export espionage now, far more than they did previously, because they can insert it within their technology and they have more countries within their sphere of influence. Second of all, because they can become your key supplier, they can request political favors, as they're doing with One Bell, One Road, when they're the key supplier of countries for semiconductors, they can replace political favors and also help governments crack down on dissidents internally because they want to export their means of, of of um, uh, you know exporting authoritarianism. That's all bad. The fourth point I want to bring to you very quickly. Jason says you're using your leverage. No, you're losing your leverage. The reason because is because you're expanding, uh, expending all of it at once. Instead of using the threat of the ban, perhaps in the future, you're just using it massively. And today, in today's climate of antagonism between them, China will not back down. You've lost the leverage, can't use it in the future to moderate China, and you've obtained nothing for any benefit. Because of all these reasons, please oppose. All right, thank you very much. Uh, to conclude the Gov case,
In this debate, I could assert that Mexico has the capacity to make semiconductors and say that I know a lot about it because I come from Mexico. But if I don't give you structural reasons as to why it actually has the capacity, that assertion doesn't count in debate land, which means that why Tudor's extension on why China has the capacity to make semiconductors actually does kind of steal O's case. My second thing on this is I think that Monica and Ido are actually really good judges. I have literally no idea what Mesh's qualifications as a judge are. I'm going to assume that it's none because he's from America we're judging this kind of shit. So, three things. One, why CEO's banter extension on the American election is out. Second, on leverage and why that wins the debate. Third, on the trade war and why we think the low-hanging fruit is the way to go in the round. Firstly, on CEO's banter extension. Okay, I'm going to posit that actually slapping sanctions of China is one of the things that Trump is kind of popular for. His whole fuck China thing has gotten him plenty of voters because it makes America look kind of strong. I also think that it not only gains him more voters, it allows him to use his look over there, confusion technique, where instead of talking about, you know, the fact that the USA is on fire, that he's a racist or that he's fixing the election, people ask him about, oh, why are you slapping sanctions on China? And he can say, they're the ones tampering with the election. They're the ones who want the Democrats to win. His confusion technique has worked before before against, you know, Joe Biden, who can't bring back things to the topic for shit. So I think that at the end of the day, if they want a clear election, they get it worse. The second thing that I think Tudor tells you on this is why we're going to win anyway. Four reasons. One, the pandemic. Second, riots. The USA is on fire and loads of racism. Three, election fixing, which is, you know, terrible. Uh, and lastly, it's because of basic statistics. I think that that, at the end of the day, means that now you create an economic harm that makes Trump look good because he's lapsed sanctions on China, then the Democrats have to deal with the fallout, and then the Republicans get to point at the failing economy and be like, look, this is a fault of the Democrats. The economy was soaring under Trump, under China made up a virus. We responded by slapping them with sanctions, and then the Democrats fucked it, and now we're in the gutter again. The poor American person is suffering, and it's all the fault of the Democrats and also the Chinese. You need the Republicans back, and then we get Melania 2025. I think that's the worst case scenario, and I think that means that CG is out of this debate. Second point in the debate, leverage. Uh, why is this so important? And look, um, I think that, look, just like I know that this is the whip, but I don't give, I, like, I get it, Finkel did it in 2011, but the WDC manual has changed many, many, many times since then. So presumably, if China agrees to your conditions like in an hour, then you're no longer propping the motion. So you're not propping a ban, you're propping sanctions. Uh, Amira was in the ACH core. I'm going to assume that, you know, this is not what the actual motion's about. But even then, why is it in the, even if we accept sort of like the cock mechanism that OG brings you, why is it that you actually get worse leverage? Look, in the status quo, okay, the United States makes semiconductors. And I think that you have some level of leverage, as Tudor tells you, when you have the capacity to, you know, tell them that you're going to raise prices if they start, you know, not behaving correctly, where you threaten them with a ban, as Tudor tells you in his extension that went unresponded to, but you don't actually ban it, right? You wait until they respond. Um, the problem now is that you lose that leverage that you have at this point in time, where Huawei is like, okay, I lose a competitive advantage if I suddenly start having to charge more and pay more for semiconductors than Samsung does. So I have an incentive to behave, which is like things that the USA and the, and the United Kingdom are already doing. And instead you ban it. You lose that leverage. Why do you lose that leverage? Because when you are playing carrot and stick, you don't bring a bazooka to the table and shoot China with it. Because now what ends up happening and what happens with the OG's mechanism is that now China is just going to be like, okay, I can't buy them anymore. There's absolutely no point trying to change it because they're just going to continue pressuring me. So I'm just going to make my own. And I think that Tudor then brings you structural reasons as to why. Let's deal first with OG's consent. What OG tells you is firstly, ah, they hate the reliance and they haven't yet made their own semiconductors, which means that, that, that they can't. I don't think it means that they can't. It just means that China is economically smart. There is no reason to spend millions and millions and millions making a semiconductor factory when you can buy it from the United States. Now that you can't, now it's when those millions are actually worth spending. She may be you know, kind of vain and a despot, but he's not an idiot. He's quite good at mathematics. So I think that now you give him a reason to, that's when he starts doing it. The second reason that they give you is, ah, China's economically weaker. It was economically weaker than they were the first country to come out of the pandemic. But more importantly, they actually have huge economic capacity to invest because China doesn't care that much if a bunch of poor people starve. They're not democratically accountable to that population. They can very, very well do that or tank alternative economies and just start investing loads of money because they're a state-run economy. So they have the capacity to act 
actually invest. The third thing that they give you, and this is laughable, they say IP loss. China has literally never given a shit about that. And indeed, we think that's a reason why they're probably going to be able to. What does Tudor tell you? Tudor gives you three unique mechanisms. Firstly, manufacturing. They have huge capacity for automation and the unique capacity to make the initial huge investment that you require to make semiconductors. Second, you also need lots of tech knowledge, which China has because they have the Chinese Silicon Valley in Shenzhen, because they have insane amounts of funding towards universities and academia, because they also can just, you know, steal your IP and not care about it. And lastly, because they have access to rare earth minerals very few other countries in the planet has. I think that at the end of the day, it means that you lose any leverage that you had. If in the short term, OG gets sort of like a boom for Western companies, that disappears when in the long term, Huawei now has its own supply and they can make their own products, sell them for cheaper. Huawei phones also have better cameras, so I really want one. And I think that at the end of the day, that means that all of the harms become way worse when you lose any potential leverage that you could have on the short term. Jason. This doesn't respond to the part of your case which assumes your best case. In that instance, Western companies that have a comparative advantage because they have better tech, can sell more phones, can develop the infrastructure and establish those networks. Yeah, yeah, I think they have comparative advantage in the short term, right? When China wants managers to, you know, make it, I think that that means that then Huawei can, you know, make a phone, make it cheaper, sell it to the countries that they want and have all of the harms that you currently say, but 10 times worse because you don't have the capacity to stop them or regulate them. And I think that this assertion is kind of based on the idea that like Chinese products are bad. A, I think that's a bit racist. Jason, your family's from China. Uh, but second, and I think this is important, is that they don't, right? They have huge capacity for brain power, manufacturing, Silicon Valley, Chinese products are very well made and can be very well made. Um, I think that that's not true. So you lose leverage. Lastly, on the trade war, opening, closing government says, oh, this is the tipping point. Look, I think the tipping point is going to be when Joe Biden starts talking on national television about fucking semiconductors. Not that this is not a riveting debate, but like low-key, it's not interesting. And I think that at the end of the day, that's going to just make him look ridiculous. The rivet, the tipping point, we both said, is when they started talking about, you know, how you lost loads of human jobs rather than machine jobs that you get from building semiconductors when you slap taxes on iron, right? So there's already the political will to stop the trade war. I think that also it's not up to the united states now it's up to china and china's gonna say fuck you we're gonna slap sanctions back i think that that means that you had all of the impacts that Tudor brought you on the trade war you lose all your leverage and also you maybe lose the election i think that means that ceo has won thank you all right thank you very much uh off whip and everyone for the debate so y'all can leave because this is silent.